tēnei nei te ruru, te koukou mai nei ki hai mā, hiti te ki hai mā, raka raka tūpoka nui o te ruru, te re kou hepo, hepo, he au kā, we te ati hei wā, mauri ora, nei rā te mihi atu ki au koutou, ko rau i ka mai, tēnei, tēnei rā mo tēnei hui e pāna te wai, me te whenua, mo te day committee, mo te kauni i rakai au ki waitā, ko tēnei te hui tua tahi, nō rera nau mai, nau mai, tau ti mai rā, ki tēnei whare o te kauni i rakai au ki waitā, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, a tēnā tātou katoa, ko huri te pokaaro ki a rātou, ko eia te kitapō, uh, ki te mātaua Māui i tēnei wā, uh, moi 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 mai oki oki mai, tira hā whakatā, kaori mātau i wariwari tia, e koutou i tēnei wā, te wā a waua, mo te, te waipuku tia i te whenua, uh, nā reira, ki au te moi, moi moi ra, moi moi oki oki mai, tira hā whakatā. Tātou ki a rātou, tātou ki a tātou, nō reira tēnā tātou katoa, welcome to the first uh, hui for the uh, Water and Land Committee of uh, Environment Canterbury. Uh, just uh, acknowledging those ones who have, have passed on with the, with the flooding up in, in the North Island, especially in, in, in around Hawke's Bay. Uh, and we know that there's still 800 people missing and hopefully um, those people will be found and just giving our thoughts to our um, Hawke's Bay Regional Council uh, at this time, I'm thinking about the work ahead. Also today is uh, the anniversary of our of the, um, 2011 um, earthquake, and then at 12:51 we'll be taking time for reflection for those who passed away and also what what had happened here in, in Canterbury. On that note, I'll hand over to uh, Councillor Swiggs, who will uh, start off with a uh, karakia today. Kia ora. Kia ora, and I was um yeah I was going to say something around the earthquakes as well, and I just wanted to add that um you know uh, natural disasters no no. Uh, boundaries and borders and I just wanted to also reflect the massive disaster that's taken place in Turkey and uh, Syria at the moment um, from that natural disaster and that earthquake so um, really uh, challenging time globally for some um, some people out there. Whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga, ki a mā tina, tina uh, ki a uta, ki a mā taratara ki tai, e he aki ana, e aku kura, e tio, E huka, e huhu, tihei, Māori Māori. Tēnā koe, kia tsa swigs. Tēnā koe, mo te karakia, tēnei, tēnei ata. Kūta katoa, tēnā tata katoa. Kia ora. This meeting will be recorded and made available on the uh, Barmy Canary website. Uh, Tony Simons, uh, the reporter, will be on joining online today, correct? Um, I've been informed there is a quorum present, uh, and I'm pleased to clear the meeting open. Um, so apologies for today, we received from um, Chair Scott, uh, Councillor Burns, Councillor Korako, Councillor Biche, and Councillor McKenzie. Please record those. Oh, yeah, sure. Sure Just an um, apology for early departure, should the meeting go on a bit later. <laughs> Thank you. Good to Councillor McKay. For those apologies, uh, is there no uh, conflicts of interest or items on today's agenda? There's no conflicts of interest. There are no public forums, no deputations or petitions. We'll move on. Uh, is there any extraordinary urgent in our business? None. Uh, and are there any notices of motion? None received. We'll move on to um, 7.1. Uh, on the agenda, our recommendations on page eight. Um, as this is the first uh, meeting for the Water and Land Committee, uh, there are no prior minutes. Um, therefore, I'd like to note uh, the recommendation is uh, that the Water and Land Committee notes that this is the first meeting of the Water and Land Committee, and therefore there are no prior minutes to confirm. Do I have a mover? Councillor Mackay, seconder. Councillor Davies. Um, all those in favour, say aye. 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 Against, none against. Uh, the motion is carried. Kia ora. Uh, on to reporting items um, 8.1. I'd like to uh, ask Cam Smith to come to the table, please. Uh, paper 8.1. Um, let's get it up. 
as the uh, work program uh, for the Land Water uh, Committee, the report. Um, Cam, thank you. Kia thank you, Chair. Um, this report um, updates the committee on the progress of key initiatives within the water and land portfolio. Um, it matches similar reporting that we're doing across a number of our portfolios um, and also complements online quarterly reporting and financial reporting through to the Audit Financial and Risk Committee. Um, this report we intend to bring back to this committee on a quarterly basis um, to provide you with a kind of a snapshot of how we're going. Um, I'd like to draw your attention to um, a couple of points. Number one, um, all initiatives are on track. Um, there's a lot of green there, which is great. Um, but we've had a number of notable kind of achievements within um, the second quarter, um, October through to December. Um, our three-year expert and consent review process is very near to completion, and we'll be looking to come back to two councillors with an update on that process and what we've learned from that. Um, we've also rolled out intensive winter grazing requirements as part of the essential freshwater package, uh, and consents are due for those um, from landowners on the 1st of May 2023. Um, and we've also got summer recreational water and aquatic health monitoring underway, and we'll, um, that's the, the summer recreational water um, is a uh, monitoring is a focus of the paper later um, in this session. Um, but I'll leave it at that and I'm welcome any questions. Uh, sure, go ahead, Cameron. Are there any uh, questions for clarification? None? You're welcome to leave the table. Thank you, Kim. Uh, first, I'll put the motion um, and then there'll be opportunity for discussion. Uh, the recommendation is on page nine of the agenda. Uh, please confirm. Oh, is it? Oh, that's on that side. Um, that the Water and Land Committee receives the key initiatives report for the Water and Land Portfolio. Do I have a mover? Um, Councillor Ward, seconder. Uh, Councillor East. Uh, all those, all those in favour. Oh, any, any discussion? No. All those in favour? Say aye. 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 All those against? None against. The motion is carried. Moving along. Um, Eight point two. Uh, drinking water nitrate testing. Um, this is in response to the notice of motion um, on the 18th of August 2022 uh, by Councillor um, Southwell. Uh, Dr. Tim Davies, everyone. Well. Kia ora, Chair. Um, I'm presenting this on behalf of uh, Carl Hansen, who is online, and also um, Taflin Bradford James, who's been involved in the this um, preparation with us all. As already outlined, it's in response to the notice of motion around an information roadshow for private well um, private well holders or um, yeah, so so I guess it's for um, people who are taking water for drinking or, or private use at individual supplies as opposed to as under municipal supplies or, or the wider schemes. Um, this is a difficult area, as outlined on paragraph eight, that there are several agencies involved in this, uh, of which Environment Canterbury as a regional council is one of them. Um, there, there are the health authorities, um, district councils and um, city councils, as well as regional councils. And, and we all have a different part to play. The Environment Canterbury role is particularly around water quality, the general water quality of um, groundwater as well as for surface water. And, and, and it is worth noting that, of course, there are surface water supplies as well that take private um, drinking water. It's not just from groundwater. So the um, staff have looked into this and have come up with three options, although um, one of the options is to do nothing further. So essentially two options um, around further work that could be done in this space. And the, as is outlined in the, um, although not explicitly spelt out, but is outlined in the recommendation. The recommendation is for option two, as described in the paper, which is a, um, in a, a um, an enhanced, publicity campaign, campaign engagement campaign for private well holders or private water supplies 
around the risks that they run and um, the, the uh, different things that can be done in terms of protection of their, for instance, their wellheads and, and water supplies, uh, and also the range of contaminants that could be, and then what, uh, how those could be tested and, and so on. So that's the recommendation. The, the, the third option is essentially option two plus a roadshow, and it was costed in around 10 different roadshow, different events that, that was based on 10 of the water zones around Canterbury. Um, and uh, so, as I, as I said, the recommendation is option two. That's based on the cost and time commitment and particularly the reallocation of staff kept um, to a minimum, but there is still a reallocation that would be required under option two. It also is on the basis that it keeps the message strong about the range of contaminants. Um, one of the things that we have found at the roadshow events is that because the measurement that's done out of the necessity of the way these things are measured, it's only nitrate that can be measured and, and that tends to push the emphasis onto nitrate when there are other contaminants as well. So um, it's on the basis that it keeps it around the range of contaminants. Of course, a roadshow can also do that as well. It also allows for a multiple agency approach without great logistics challenge. So that's being done through a, a campaign. So that's the staff recommendation for option two, but option three is set out there for your consideration as well. I just start with, as I said before, we, we recognise that um, drinking water is a contentious issue. Um, and what we're wanting to do is maintain action around changes and improvements of drinking water at the wider level, which is our responsibility. But uh, I welcome questions. Uh, Tim, thank you for that. Uh, you may sit back. Tim, thank you for that. You may sit back on the table first. Uh, any uh, questions or clarification? Yeah, questions of clarification first, and then Tim, sit back. Thank you. So a couple just on the um the reallocation side of things. So it mentioned it's reallocation from contact recreation. And I'm just wanted to check that's not about the monitoring side of things, is it? It's about the comms part. Yes, that is correct, Councillor Southworth. It, it is to do with the what um because of the amount of time that we required and, and we looked and said well the, the natural place would be to move it from the contact recreation engagement program but the monitoring would still continue for contact recreation. And then um, the other one was um, just the disparity in cost between a campaign, a publicity campaign, which was like $20,000 for production, advertising, distribution, and then you've got the staff time. Whereas for the roadshow events, it's 75, 74 and a half thousand for advertising and publicity. And I'm just a bit, don't quite understand why it's so much more for for what's supposed to be a lesser of a campaign and more of a testing at the road show where you you know can get a lot of traction with Facebook and all those sorts of things. So Kathleen, you answer. Yes, uh, thank you. Um so the difference really it fundamentally is the fact that the option two isn't time sensitive. And so we can allow um, organic social media and we can push a little bit more out through our own channels and allow the time that that will take to reach people. Whereas the other one is time sensitive. And so to ensure that we've got good attendance at those events, we would do a, an inform, we'd probably use print media as well as social media, and we would actually pay to boost those posts. And we would do reminders as well. So it, because of the time sensitivity, it requires us to put money into it in a time frame, whereas the other one we would allow to run more organically. So it does boost the cost. And if you're doing 10 venues, your time's in that local message times 10 to get people to attend. So that's where most of the difference would be. Anything else, Vicky? No, because I'll, I'll talk to the other stuff in this. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I just, I guess my question is in that cost reallocation, if uh, I remember correctly from my time in the Upper Waitaki, one of our biggest challenges is, is contact recreation on those lakes and issues and the campaigns that have been particularly important in that aspect. So, I would be concerned and would want to know what we lose in, in that conversation to bolster a conversation over here. And I'm 
yeah, I, I really am challenged that we would take money out of one consultation pot to put into another when I recognise the real value of some of those other conversations. So some, I guess, refinement of that thinking or answer would be really useful for me. Yeah, happy to answer that. So, um, I mean, for example, we have one person who looks after our social media. So they can only be doing a certain amount of work at any given time. We have one person who is, um, if you like, narrow and deep around the water quality piece. Andrew is in the room now. Um, and so we can only be focusing on one thing at a time. And so it's the obvious place to take it from in terms of the staff resource allocation. It's a different conversation if we want to run these things in parallel. That's why we've got in the that we potentially would require more resources if we want to run something at the same time as running these other campaigns. So it is just the trade off in terms of we've got a finite number of people who can do the different parts of the role, whose skills we need to apply to it. Yeah, I guess it's just that the, yeah, the prioritization becomes the challenge for me. Is this Vicky you carrying on? Yeah. Right. Follow up question from the answer to John's question. So just in terms of, um, so yeah, totally understanding that single resource. In terms of the timing, though, I mean, I'm me like a a roadshow around nitrate might be you, know, you could run that at a time when it's not during contact recreation is really around a summer. It's a specific period in time. Um, so how do you know that they don't necessarily line up those two issues? Um, arguably. In, some of the pollution issues and around drinking water are more critical around heavy rainstorm periods of time. Sort of, I know that's when our groundwater report goes out. It's sort of like after we do a lot of testing after the winter period when a lot of water flushes, rainfall flushes through. So that's the timing side. I don't know that they're necessarily the two two campaigns would necessarily align well in terms of giving up one in terms of the time, if you see what I mean, if you see what I mean, the seasonality of it, that's what I'm trying to get to, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Partly around the expertise that we need to apply to it, but also those same people are running campaigns constantly, so the essential fresh water um, information that's going out, the, um, the warmer, cheaper air campaign, it's time Canterbury. Um, so all of these, you know, the, the um, river engagement campaign. So all of this is the same people who are doing it. So we have to we'd have to make a call on something. That's one thing. What is it that's going to stop to allow us to do this? And because of the expertise around the water knowledge and the water quality, that's the piece that, that fits the most naturally with the expertise. But you're, it's exactly yeah to, to your point. You could move the timing but something would have to move somewhere to absorb it or several things diminishing yeah which gives you a lesser impact on any one of those yeah well oh, thanks teflon um joe do you have a kind of sketch of the breakdown of that twenty thousand dollars between production distribution and advertisement Yes, um, not on me, but essentially on the twenty thousand dollars, the production is largely done um, because it would be it's material that we've already got. So for option two, we'd really be repurposing information that we and other agencies have. So we would be taking people to existing information. So there wouldn't be a lot on the production side. So it is more than production of any advertising that we do. So that would be sort of graphic design time and also um, input from the comms advisors time. So most of that is on the boosting of social media posts and any if if we did any print and within 20,000 there's there's not a lot of wiggle room for for print in there so yeah um Jordan, uh please thank you very much um Tim talked about uh the testing and it's under the option 3 it's outlines that the um cost things is does relate to just a single test we know that water quality has a number of attributes from a health um, perspective do we have some sort of idea if this was to become a full-blown water quality testing how big this could actually potentially get because i am just a bit concerned about the narrowness of it but i'll discuss that later when we open the discussion so just some sort of quantum ideas of potential if it was to be a full suite of testing yeah through you chair the difficulty particularly around um e coli um 
is that you can't test it on the day. It requires an incubation period. So that's a it's it's not something that we can uh, provide an instant result. So while we could, you know, the, the samples could go on to another lab, it, it, that's a, there's a substantial cost involved in that. The other types of contaminants that you see, particularly in groundwater, um, are around dissolved heavy metals, and that's that again is a a substantial laboratory test that can't be done in the field. You know, essentially what we're doing is we're taking field equipment and and doing it on the day, so it would require laboratory testing and and. I, I think the best that we could do would be to point that these things need to be tested for and how they could be done rather than actually trying to run it as an event on the day with that information. So Tim, just, just on that, you you and have a ballpark figure on that? Uh, so do you mean for, for somebody doing a test, getting a test done? Yeah, we'll say if, uh, um, if someone wanted to get testing done, say for one area, what you just said, had to go to laboratory, labs, et cetera. Um, I might just call on Carl Hansen as online. Carl, do you know the, the cost of a, if, if for a suite of things that would be done for drinking water if it was sent to a laboratory? Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Um, a typical drinking water suite test at a laboratory will be somewhere on the order of $200, $250 for the test, but that will really only include some of those contaminants. If you really wanted to do a full suite of what could possibly be in a water supply, which is what we're recommending people do at least once, um, you're looking more on the order of 500 to 1,000 because you're, you're looking at not just those those few heavy metals and nitrate, but you're looking at organic contaminants, um, the possibility of any um, hydrocarbons, industrial solvents, pesticides. Um, you know, there is a bit of judgment there in, in how far a person would want to go. Um, so I suppose the short answer is it could be anywhere from 250 to $1,000, depending on how how detailed you wanted to go into your testing. Carl, thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Is it on this one, Carl? Okay. Um, so, Carl, so you said there maybe the um, Kia ora, yeah, Carl or Tim. Yep. So, you recommended there that that full suite, the five hundred to a thousand dollar one, be done once. Is that like a is that like a baseline test? And then, how regularly would the sort of the other Two hundred and fifty dollar suite. How, what would we recommend people to do? Like, are we saying do that once a year, or uh -huh. or once every five years, or if we were to recommend that? Yeah, um, I think we've we we've, we've sort of tell people once a year for, um, and it's probably really the nitrate and the E. coli are the ones that you'd probably want to do ongoing. Most of those other ones, as you say, would be a baseline test just to. Just to know whether anything is there um, or, or or could potentially be there. But once you've done it once and if you if you don't find anything, it's not something that you need to do regularly. But nitrate and E. coli are the ones that that can probably change most over time. And I mean, really, you're probably best to do them maybe quarterly for a year or two and then depending on those results, you can sort of back off. There's no magic number about exactly how frequently you need to do it, which does make the the, the messaging a little bit more complicated. Um, so, it, you know, the short answer would say at least do it once a year. Um, but you could you could, as I say, do it more frequently in, in when you first start testing and then. Um, relax over time, if depending on the results you get. And those those tests, the nitrate test is generally on the order of what ten, twenty dollars for a test, and an E. coli test sort of thirty dollars maybe. Thank you. Um, 
So I'm assuming like as part of our option two stuff, if we do agree with that, those sort of things about that information for people to help them with their own testing of their own um, wells would be something we'd put together to help them that know where to go, how much things cost, cool, and frequency. Cool, thank you. Right. Councillor Pauling, uh, Vicky, do you have a clarification? So it was, it, it got answered. In. I guess I thought I'll move on to Dion. Oh, Council Swiggs. Yeah, I was just a um, question around uh, is this duplicating something that's already existing in the market? Um, the, so the, the, the normal way that tests are done are with private laboratories. So in that sense, yes. Um, this is probably less, though, about the actual testing and more about the information that's been um, that's going with that. So I think, and this would be a learning that we have had when these events have been run before, that you know it's about getting the information out there as much as it is the, the tests themselves. A follow-up question to that is that, I mean, I we've just had this conversation down at OTOP around, around doing this project ourselves, and we're looking to allocate some money towards doing this. And I'm just, I'm wary of duplication of effort from a marketing point of view, because, you know, apparently we're going to be asking marketing to do some work on this. I'm not sure exactly how the process works um, internally, but yeah, my point is that duplication of efforts is, is my concern, and I don't necessarily want to see resource pulled here for what we're doing centrally and then locally in the, the zone committees, we're going to be doing something down there. So I'm just wondering, is there, has that been in, what, factored into the cost or anything around that? I'm just a little bit unsure from reading the paper. Um, it hasn't been factored into the cost at the moment in terms of the visibility of whether zone committees are wanting to do this alone. Um, that work does come back in to the same team to actually support that. So it is still our staff. So in response to the zone committee, that the zone committees, as you know, have got that money for community engagement. So in terms of the actual advertising cost, then that could well come out of zone committee funding. Um, but the staff time would still be coming out of the same teams. But you're exactly right in terms of the best response to a marketing effort. If it's joined up and coordinated, it would be much more effective <laughs> than if it's that they're running in parallel or potentially even competing with each other, which would be, be worse. So, but it would essentially be the same staff, so it would be the same information. So there wouldn't be conflicting information. It might be just conflicting campaigns if it wasn't joined up. So yeah, certainly if we were going ahead with um, any kind of roadshow show around option three, then one of the first points would be to find out what the zone committees have in mind and make sure that we're using the zone committee network as well as part of delivering this. Yeah, and whether there was any funding there. Does that answer the question? It's just a just a point uh, to ask on that um, through the chair, I suppose, is what I should be asking. Um, you you meant option three, but even in option two, if the zone committees are going to be doing this, uh, is that going to reduce the cost and burden on this particular campaign that we're looking at doing centrally, or is it, yeah, from a time and staff point of view, I'm not sure. From a time and staff point of view, probably not. Um, but from uh, certainly a cost of advertising, if zone committees were looking to put some of their community engagement funding towards it, then that could. But one of the, the next steps, regardless of option, will be to talk to the other agencies, the TAs, the zone committees, to make sure that we're all on the same page. Because one of the risks, as we've said, it needs it needs to be joined up, yeah, so that it doesn't look like the environment can't be just pushing this out. Go to Councillor Swiggs. Just a clarification on this one, Councillor Sunderland. Yeah. Or, yeah. Thank you. Um, I just yeah, looking at, at option three, I, I asked the question and seek clarification as to what we will genuinely achieve if we do more monitoring into the space. We have mainframes full of data. Um, I sit on Ground and Service Water Expert Review Panel, CPW, where we're considering our reports. So we have the data, we have the monitoring, we have the knowledge. What will further monitoring achieve when we already know what the outcomes are required. So really, what do we achieve is my question if, if we went further, knowing what we already know. Through you, Chair, I, I think the, um, as, as I outlined earlier, it's 
less to do with the monitoring data and more to do with the uh, generation of information for the public. And, yeah. Council of Ward, is it regarding this or you have another question? Yeah, just from a um, food producer's perspective and a, and a farmer, like we used to have to test our wells every year because you know, the water that was going on our crops, the water we used to process those crops with had to be up, up to standard. So we were doing a full suite of tests anyway. So a lot of a lot of farmers and what I'm saying in the rural community will have all, all that information that's been done on an annual basis. So what are we actually trying to achieve? And, 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 and at what cost? Um, I again, I think that the cost side of it, I think, is covered. But the um, that again, it, it's to do with getting information for private well holders, not all of whom are farmers. But I take your point. The information that is there now. Welcome, uh, Council Southwest. This is regarding the same topic. Or... I'm just putting my hands on my phone. Um, we've got Councillor Pauline and then Councillor Ward. Gilda. Um, yeah, my, my question of clarifications, I think if you look at clause eight in our paper, you can sort of see partly of why the community have some issues around this, because you have a look at it, four different agencies, probably more if you take the TLA as a separate entities where they are um, sort of involved around this, but clause nine, no specific agency is responsible for their own well. So, um, my question was really, I mean, I know that in those clauses there in that background, but you know, down you get down to the bottom about the notice of motion, and we're saying that we do have a relationship of, I mean, a responsibility, of course, for protecting water sources. Um, and I suppose that's the key thing that's sort of part of my question is the information that we're going to go out to, and it sort of relates to what Councillor Swig said around the, the market. We're sort of trying to give people the right information so that they understand that their private well is theirs to their responsibility to look after. Um, they effectively built it and got it put in. Um, so I'm just making sure that that's going to be a key part of our option two and I suppose option three, but the information sort of download, getting the right information for those community members to understand who is responsible, that they are, but that we are there for the background um, uh, management. And that was probably my other question. Do, do we consent each bore or, or are these permitted activities so therefore we don't really see them come through this building? Very good, Chair. The, um, so uh, in answer to your first question, yes, very much so. It is about emphasising the responsibility and, and um, uh, I guess the only comment I would make on that would be from the experience with the road shows it's difficult to tell because you're not we're not following up with people but our uh, perception is that often people will take those great i've had my water tested and 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 that some of that information isn't getting through but that's a perception i we don't, i don't have hard evidence to back that up we certainly have put in there that you know about the responsibilities and and how that could be done um and that's what we would be emphasizing in the uh in this um and I've just forgotten the or second the, question. Are they consented? Oh, are they consented? Yes. Uh, no, they're not. It's a permitted activity. So the taking of drinking water. Well, in fact, it's not even a permitted. It's allowed under the Resource Management Act. It's um, so the the um, it, we do not see, and that's what we don't have records on. Um, but the 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 single point where it does come in is the territorial authorities when a new house is built. If it has a dry, private drinking water supply, I think it's outlined on in paragraph eight. They they do it. Um, it has to be shown that it is potable water, and that's the single time. And do they the TLAs come to us to check that, or do they have their own records? How, how does that get checked? They have their own records, so it's held with the as I understand it, it's held with the building consent. I think I believe that's the case. Okay, Sato, is there any more um, questions of clarification? Oh, sorry, Tiff. Sorry, 
don't mind sort of through you, Chair. I just had another point for um, Councillor Pauling that one of, for example, one of the um, avenues that we're looking at, one of the channels is rural real estate. And so people who were buying lifestyle blocks or buying properties that, that where they're inheriting a private well, who may have no idea what their obligations are around their own testing and things, that's a, an avenue that we thought would be quite useful. So there are some different channels that we perhaps haven't used in the past that we would loop into our either option two or three, where we might try and get to people when they're making those decisions. Thank you. Chair Teflon for that clarification. Any other points of clarification for um, Dr Davies? Yeah, just thinking a little bit outside the box, you were saying that the council has the ability, well, has the data on their, well, in the limbs, I suppose, that there's a private well on the, the properties. I, I believe that's true, but I, I wouldn't be able to say how they store that information. I, I don't know. I was thinking an easy way to sort of like get this information out to people would be to utilise that data to just put it in a rates bill or something like that to say, have you checked your well recently? I mean, I'm just thinking yeah. outside the box um, to make this a lot easier for people. I mean, that's just me. Um, but I did have one question relating to point seven that um, uh, Councillor Pauling mentioned before. Will three waters change this, um, say, in a, a regulation? You, you mentioned that the private wells aren't regulated at the moment, but does three waters change that? I was unsure. Um, through you, Chair, the, um, under the three waters legislation as it's proposed now, and of course it hasn't been through, the, um, the city and district council part of it is transferred to the new water entities. So it doesn't, it changes it in terms of the entities involved, but it doesn't in terms of, you know, there's, there's another group there. The only other thing I would add is that um, it is proposed to bring in, so that, uh, I, I can't think of the official terminology, but um, a multiple supply. So often there will be two or three houses coming off a single well, more than one point of supply. Thank you, Councillor Sankal. That, that that would be brought under Tomata ROI as the regulator. Um, so it would be left with the kind of single, single well, single house would uh, not have a regulator. Turn up with um, um, that's Toby. Toby. No more points of clarification. Uh, thanks, Tim. You sit back on the table. Um, First, I'll put the motion uh, on the screen, um, 8.2, uh, that it's up an updated um, staff recommendation approves option two um, with staff from Environment Canterbury conducting an information campaign without water testing events to promote awareness among private well owners about their responsibilities for their drinking water supplies and the potential risk to those supplies from contaminants. Do I have a mover? Councillor Sankwell, seconder. Councillor Robinson. Um, any, uh, any discussions? Thank you, Mr Chairman. I, I do support this option and I would like uh, Council to consider, I think, some of the things that brought up by Councillor Swiggs and others of talking to our TA colleagues as to what can be put into limbs and, and the like associated as as part of that reminder and process. Um, there is a, a, a measure of self-responsibility. So I, I see our role as, as advising, uh, highlighting, and through whatever avenue we can, though so, yeah, fully support this, but looking at whatever other avenues we can to, to highlight it through the systems. Oh, thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, a, a, good, a good report, and I, and I support the motion too. I think that the original um, proposal by Councillor McKenzie, uh, the, the intent uh, is is there. Um, she was certainly wanting some greater testing to understand pathogens and pesticides and other things that might be in people's water supply. But I suppose having having some information, um, allowing people to um, test their wells uh, at whatever level, basic level nitrates and E. coli or um, find out a little bit more. Um, 
this the dilemma we have is the New Zealand drinking water standards um, set a very high level of, at 11.3 milligrams per litre. And there are many wells, private wells, where people are not sure of what, especially those nitrate values might be for their own well after they get the initial sign off from the, from the district council. In terms of the district council, it's, it is on your limb. They identify the well number and um, it, it's recorded with a G, GPS uh, recording. Um, the, the, the value at, at 11.3, I know in Waimakariri a couple of years ago, some residents in West Eaton um, came to the, the, the zone committee and we were gobsmacked. They had informed us that the, some of their levels were in excess of 11.3 and they were drinking it and had no idea that they were that they were no longer uh, a potable supply, so they had to get some 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 treatment. Why Macquarie District Council then has uh, instigated some uh, testing of some wells in some really high priority areas themselves, um, and um, I know that uh, members of the zone committee uh, had also worked with a researcher recently to take nitrate testing on on the lines of um, a community participation. So there's a lot of there's a lot of concern. It's, it's about people's health and well-being, and um, and we really need to make sure that in our messaging we get people to understand that it's a pretty critical issue for them. I mean, the crazy thing is, in terms of ecological values, that the aquatic um, level for aquatic organisms is 2.4 milligrams per litre. So human beings are actually um, drinking water that's far in excess of um, uh, aquatic organisms. Um, there is a uh, proposed amendments to the environment standards for drinking water, um, and they proposed source water risk management zones. And there is a zone three in that document which suggests that uh, a whole catchment area is considered, um, especially with its persistent contaminants and cumulative effects. Um, so those source risk areas are not point source, they're more of a wider distribution. And obviously that's something that, that Environment Canterbury will be uh, probably looking at uh, when those regulations come into play. Um, the NPS on freshwater management also has a couple of um, appendices, 1A and 1B, which talks about water quality, and they identify compulsory values required to be addressed for ecological health including health in the aquifer. So if the aquifer is highly uh, polluted, has nutrients and toxicants, then that's an issue for, for us to um, look at in terms of how we manage our land and water. Um, and I agree with, with others that um, a signed up, uh, joint up approach uh, in the messaging, following up with the TAs, and that it's not just a, a quick um, campaign that there is some continuing um, information provided. Um, and as Councillor Swig suggested, maybe there is an annual thing that the TAs uh, put into the rates bill just to remind, especially in Waimakariri, with about 6,000 um, private well holders on, on lifestyle blocks, just to remind them that, that this is the you know their annual bill and this is possibly something that they should look at. Um, and, and yeah, the, the idea on, on, on point eight, where there's so many agencies, including um, Health New Zealand, um, that are involved with this, and um, it, it does seem extraordinary, really. But um, yeah, support support the motion, um, and hopefully we can have a really good, informative uh, campaign. Uh, kia ora, Councillor Eads. Councillor Robinson, as a seconder, I should have asked you if you had if you wanted to say anything. Uh, not at this stage, no. Sorry. Move on to uh, Councillor Southwood. Um, so just to flag that I want to add in a second part to the recommendation. So I'm not quite sure where in this I do that, but should I speak to oh, we'll the place? We have to move this one first. Right, and then that bit. Great. Okay. I've got the other place. 
Oh, I can put it now. OK, and then I'll talk to the, the whole. So um, I would like to propose as a second point um, to put request staff from Environment Canterbury in conjunction with the territorial authorities, the Mana Ora and Zone Committees, investigate running private well water testing events following on from an information campaign. Now, just talking to all of it. So um, I, the Southern Waihara Zone, which I was on last term, was the first to have run private well testing events. We put on two and they were both incredibly well attended to the point where we actually had to turn people away. It was, um, I think, around 100 people came to one and over 70 to the other. Um, I spoke yesterday to the former co-chair of that zone committee um, about her experience on, of, of that event, of one of those two events, in terms of was it completely focused on nitrates? Did people leave without understanding about some of these other aspects of water, which are absolutely critical, like the E. coli, the pathogens, are really impactful on health in the very short term particularly young children, particularly elderly, other people with vulnerability. So the, the purpose of that testing event was always to make sure we communicated around the broader conversation of water testing and water quality and understanding of the health impacts and, and, and also responsibility. So that was the purpose. Um, I think in this case, the cost and the delay, if we were to go with option three, is and, and it would have to go through a number of processes. I think that's there's a risk there that it might just not happen. So I'm really keen to say, yep, yeah, let's go with this campaign. But it would be great to see the successful type nest testing events where zone committees are prepared to do it and want to get engaged and where we can get our territorial authorities involved as well. That would be really great. The purpose of my notice of motion was to make it efficient. It was to that we didn't just do a piecemeal zone committee over here. And then sometime later, a zone committee down there, meantime in between, we've lost knowledge, lost the sort of momentum and, and the coordination because there were lessons learned from our previous events that would be really useful to bring back. Um, and, you know, it's easier to just roll something through in a coordinated way across the region. Um, I think um, one of the gaps I know from those events, which we've mentioned that other organisations that have a, play, a role to play in here, that would be great to bring them on board. One particular that cap that came through with respect to the nitrates was what's the best way of treating them if you do have a higher result come back. And that's something where Tomata Arawai actually could have a really good role to play because everybody's just sent off to the internet to go and research for themselves what's the best way for you to do it. and it's complex so speaking really to um, council awards point around the fact that farmers get this stuff tested on an annual basis and so on that's great farmers have, you know understand these things as an engineering geologist i understand these things but i also know many other people won't so it's easy to think that it's easy to understand when it's your thing that you do <laughs> but it's really not easy for other people who are doing other things with their lives so i think there's um lots of opportunity here to connect up with all those different organizations to do something that's grassroots and, and connected through the testing events but also to do a really clear good region-wide campaign that really emphasizes all those key issues that we need to have people understanding for the good of their health and i think as an organization of environment Canterbury the calibre of staff and our standing in, in community and responsibilities around water that we're well placed to sort of fill a gap. Frankly, there is a gap. People are left to take you know, responsibility for their private well, and that's tricky if you don't know. So let's let's take a stand and be the um, organisation that leads on it, but but brings everyone else in. Thank you. Uh, tēnā koe, uh, Councillor South, Southworth. Um, just in regards to just a point of um, clarification, um, just in the wording, sorry, and this is um, in conjunction, um, what would that mean is that, is that uh, we are um, making, we can't really put on TLAs and Tamana Order, uh, et cetera, to do it. So we, do we need to change that wording? I'm just trying to get a point of clarification. Yep. Thank you, Chair. Yes, um, we can't commit other other agencies to do this, so it needs to be a formal wording. Um, I, I've just been toying with it, but a request staff from Environment Canterbury 
to request CAs into mana ora and zone committees to work with Environment Canterbury in an investigation running. Is that I'm looking to my colleagues at the back whether that's likely to fulfil just that difficulty of that in the in the notice in the um, recommendation we can't. What you've just said there, Tim, is what I meant by that. <laughs> I was trying to keep it short, but I think there's no way of keeping it for short. I'm, I'm happy to second that if you need one. Once the words are up. Yeah. Unless you want to do it, sorry. Oh, true, so. Paper says it's wrong. Council Southworth, you you happy with that amended amended motion there? I am. I'm just, I mean, just to, sorry, words, but I'm just wondering if she said to invite rather than request. Like, can we even request? Yeah, invite to, Should yeah. it be invite? Yes. <laughs> Love to think we could just request one. <laughs> the proposed amendment moved by Councillor Southworth reads uh, request staff from Environment Canterbury to invite territorial authorities to Mana Order and Zone Committees to work with Environment Canterbury in an investigation into running private well water testing events following on from an investigation information campaign. Um, Councillor Pauline, you happy to second that? Yeah, I'm just. No, Councillor Pauline, it is seconded. Uh, any discussion? No, Chair, I just got a clarification. Is this an amendment or an addition to the to the substantive? Because they can both work together. It's an addition. Yes. Um, at the moment, it's a, it's a um, an addition. Um, and but if if uh, the original mover and seconder are happy. Um, could be we could together or we could do it individually. If the original mover and seconder are happy to include that in their motion. Given there is no commitment or finance, it is a purely request, I'm happy for it to be included. Councillor Robinson. Are you happy for this to be included into the original um, motion? So therefore, they'll be read together. All right. Um, therefore, this is an addition um, to the original motion. Um, it was the addition was moved by Council Southwest, seconded by Council Pauline. All those in favour? Oh. Okay. Oh. Yeah. I'm going to. I'll support both of them. I just want to be clear. I'm, I'm very uncomfortable with us potentially committing resource to doing something the market already does. Uh, so I, I, I'm going to support it, and I'm really keen for the the work to go down locally. Um, so I don't want this necessarily. Well, this is my opinion. I don't want this to sort of be something that's centrally driven, where we've got zone committees who have the territorial authorities within those zones already, and we're talking with the councillors in the respective places. This work is happening down in those places, um, in those you know local areas, and this issue is quite localised. So I just want to be, I want to see that work um, be strengthened through through this motion. But I, but I'm uncomfortable 
with us committing any finances towards something that the market would do. I think if we give information to people so that they then commit to doing it, that's a great thing. Um, but I don't don't want to see a perverse outcome that ends up landing on our desk. Uh, just councillors, we just uh, just a bit of clarification on it. Oh, and just addition to that is that um, I suppose not everyone uh, is involved in their own committees and 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 locally, etc. So sometimes they do go to a website and try to look for other areas for information. So, you know, we're trying to cover both. You know, I, I, I'm happy with. So, thank you for your your points, Councillor Robinson. I am in general happy. However, I just the only concern I have, and through you um, and the chair, uh, is the chair, um, is the underplaying. I think of the potential risks for nitrate contamination. And I know we're referring to the Prime Minister's office and the results from that. I just, I think with regards to potential risks and remedy of that, those risks and contamination, I think we really need to also highlight the real nitrate risks and that is, you know, cancers and things like that. Um, I just don't want us to have that underplay as part of a campaign when when there's lots of research involved. Um, that's just my comment. Thank you. No, I think the original notice of motion by Council of Southworth, I don't really want to speak on behalf of her, but that was one of the you know um, one of the big factors. It's actually the yeah, the dangers of high nitrates in drinking water and also the pathogens and what that means. So hopefully through this campaign that it'll um, it'll strengthen um, the information's already out there to actually Acknowledge that this is there is an issue, and please, you know, take it seriously. Yeah, kia ora. Um, Council Mackay. Thanks. So we're still in discussion on this before yes. we vote on it. Thank you. Um, I, I'm going to support the motions that's up now up there uh, today, <laughs> but I just want to share, I guess, some of my reservations. And really, um, like Council said, well, I have some concerns around the prioritisation of uh, staff and finances, perhaps. Uh, around this, and as Councillor Swig says, um, let's use the, the, the information and stuff that's already got there and through our networks of um, public health and the TAs and as well as ourselves. So um, I'm sure um, staff in this organisation have taken that on board. I uh, will support this. I uh, like the idea that um, we're talking about potential risks to supply from contaminants and being very broad. And I come from this from a very much a personal perspective, um, being involved in an example relatively recently where a little one who had been on our farm um, three weeks prior to being admitted to hospital toxic septicemia. Um, and all the authorities looked immediately to the fact that this youngster had been on a dairy farm, so therefore, uh, obviously, that's where they got so sick from. Of course, that was E. coli, uh, not nitrates or anything like that. And this direction of blame actually even came from our local TA, which really disappointed me. Um, through investigation, it showed it was actually an insecure water tank, but in the end, it had the E. coli that was found in our water tank was totally different to the E. coli in the child, so totally unrelated. But in the meantime, as landowners, as farm owners, with responsibility and with a, um, a very, very sick child um, on our minds, we had something like three weeks of pain and anguish to endure as well in investment. So we all, every one of us, um, has an impact on the environment, from contaminants, from nutrients, from pollutants, but the cause not necessarily directly from our groundwater could be insecure tanks and consumer abilities. Um, as the Council of Southworth talked about, um, the environmental weather events at the time can certainly have big impacts as well. So look, I'm, I'm going to support this uh, from an information campaign and awareness, but yeah, just hoping that we can be efficient with our finances and not take away from some of our other work that we do. Tēnākui, Councillor. Thank you for that. Um, Councillor Pullman. Kia ora. Well, first of all, um, just acknowledge uh, Councillor Southworth for bringing the notice of motion last year and raising this issue, so thank you. Um, yeah, definitely support the staff recommendation 
option two. I think this is about just as uh, Tim has said a number of times, getting the information to our community that need it. That's really what this is about. We're not replicating anything that the market does uh, because we're trying to point them to the market where they can go to get the help. So I think that's really important. Um, and also we're trying to step up uh, in our role as the regulator of the protection of groundwater uh, anyway. So I think that's really important. Um, and that's something that I really think we should emphasise too, is that that is our, our role um, and that that's something that we will be addressing in our integrated planning work um, and, you know, groundwater protection work. So that's something that's important to, as well for people to understand. Um, and it made me think about, um, in the questions earlier on, um, you know, the TLAs and them doing their potable water check on the, each building consent or whatever when they do that. It does seem weird that we're not involved in that, and it would be great if whatever information comes out of this program that we do, uh, and with uh, this the additional uh, recommendation today, that you know that information sheet goes to those people at that point when they get their building consent or they sign off for their bore. That would be great, <laughs> you know, so they know right then um, there's no surprises. So I think that's something that we can work together with TLAs with, and then. In the future, as I heard today, potentially with the new water entities, again, be great to get in there early and make sure the right information gets to the people that need it uh, at that time. So, yeah, really support uh, this and getting information out to people. So, Kelda. Thank you, Councillor Pauline. And um, yeah, I'm sure staff will take on those, uh, that, some of your conversation there as well. Sure, and your points. Kia ora, Councillor Davies. I will actually be abstaining on this because while I support the intent, I can't support the $35,000 price tag into editing a website, boosting a dozen Facebook posts and generating some digital design, even though we've heard that most of that production has already been worked through. So for me as a, as a first-term councillor as well, I'm not sure where the reductions are coming from. I'm sure, sure more senior councillors understand that and they see where the allocation of funds within the portfolio is moving, but it's my first uh, Order of that committee. Well, it's all in our first order of that committee, but for me, um, I can, I'll be abstaining on these notes. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, any other uh, any other questions before we go to the go to the vote? No. Kia ora. Um, thank you, uh, uh, Councillor Saint Hill and Councillor Robinson, um, for moving and seconding. Uh, we had a good discussion. Um, all those in favour, say aye. 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 Those against. Extensions. Do you want that recorded? Please record that. Uh, therefore, the motion is carried. Kia ora, kia ora, Councillor Sasset. Okay, to Hari Tonu, Waru Rikati Toru, 8.3. I'd like to call um, Tim and Shir uh, Shirley, Hayward. Shirley Hayward to the table, please. And Tim, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Chair. And um, really, my role here is to introduce uh, many of you all know Shirley Hayward, who is the team leader for the Water Quality Science Group. Um, and Shirley was the author of this paper. And um, but also to introduce somebody who is probably new to you, which is Dr. Elaine Moriarty. And Elaine is um, has just started. I think it was last week as the surface water science manager. Some of you may recall Helen Shaw was the previous surface water science manager, and Elaine, who has been with Environment Canterbury for a year in a different role, and she has moved across into the surface water science manager role. Um, coincidentally, Elaine has a uh, well, not coincidentally, but um, in, in strength to this paper, Elaine has a background around microbiology and some of the things that are discussed in this paper. So uh, just to introduce Elaine to you, and then I'll hand on to Shirley, who can talk to the paper. Kia ora. Right. Is that working? Thank you. Uh, yeah, kia ora koutou. So the purpose of this paper was to uh, provide the committee with an update on the contact recreational monitoring program mid-season in terms of how it's going. Uh, that paper covers most of the key issues and, and really I'm just going to focus on a, a couple of components that have had a, 
um, kind of key issues for this season. Uh, just a reminder that Environment Canterbury, through our contact recreational monitoring program, we monitor 57 freshwater sites, that's lakes and rivers, and 46 coastal sites um, on a weekly or near weekly basis over the popular swimming season, which is about late November to early March. Uh, the sites that we do monitor have been identified over the years as popular sites, particularly for swimming, but also for other contact recreational activities like um, boating. Uh, and I just wanted to highlight a couple of sites that were mentioned in the paper, particularly the Whakaraupo Littleton Harbour, and I'll talk to uh, that a bit more. Um, also mentioned in the paper was the Waipra River Swimming Hole, so if you don't know where that is, that's um, north of Amberley. And just to outline the, how the program runs, we follow the Ministry for the Environment and Ministry of Health guidelines and, that were developed in 2003, the guidelines for uh, microbial quality of recreational areas. And those guidelines set out both um, responsibilities of various agencies, and primarily that's the responsibilities of, of regional councils in terms of monitoring and reporting, responsibilities of the health authorities for assessing health risks and for the TAs and city councils in terms of communicating those health risks. For assessing health risks, we use the monitoring data that we collect, that is the weekly sampling data, to um, provide information around health risks. So there are two components. The first is the development or the assessment each year of a long-term grade. And that's a grade that determines what the overall level, level, level of health risk is. It uses five years of data of that weekly sampling data to calculate a statistic. And then it combines it with known, uh, known risks for each site. So that's things like stormwater outfalls, stock access and waterways, um, those sort of um, obvious risks. There's a five point grading system from very good, good, poor, uh, very good, good, fair, poor, and very poor. Sites with long term grades of good through to fair are considered generally suitable for swimming. And sites graded poor to very poor are considered generally unsuitable for swimming. But it is a, a kind of gradient of increasing risk from very good to very poor. In addition to those long-term grades, the weekly surveillance sample is also very important to identify short-term health risks, and primarily at those sites that are generally considered suitable for swimming, that occasionally have a high faecal event that require some sort of health warning issued. I just want to focus on uh, particularly the the, both the grading and the monitoring that we've been doing this season on Whakarapo, Littleton Harbour. This graph here, I'm not sure, or the map here, I'm not sure if it's very clear, but it is. Uh, hopefully you can see it. Um, it. It shows the eight sites that we have been routinely monitoring in Littleton Harbour over the last decade. Um, the coloured dots indicate the grade that was assessed at the start of the season for each of those sites. And what it what it shows is that at five out of those eight sites are graded as uh, poor, which means they are generally considered unsuitable for swimming. Three sites, uh, Cass Bay, Paradise Beach at Chartres Bay and Church Bay are graded good or fair, so that means they are considered generally suitable for swimming. It is a significant change. Last year, there was only one site that was graded poor, and so there has been quite a, a change in terms of the number of sites that are graded as unsuitable for swimming. And understandably, that's uh, disappointing to the community. I just want to focus on uh, a couple of uh, sites and a couple of uh, Cass Bay and Corsair Bay as examples around the the subtle differences and why they're graded, one graded uh, fair and one graded poor. 
and the two bays are quite uh, are next to each other. So Kess Bay, the site is currently graded as fair, which means it's generally suitable for swimming. Uh, the graph on the left shows the the five yearly or six yearly data set shows the five year data set that was used to calculate that grade. The green dots indicate that the concentrations of faecal indicator bacteria, which is enterococci or marine waters, green means it's well below the um, thresholds of health concern, orange means it, it, it's at the alert level state status, which is some of the concern, and red dot means that the concentrations exceed the um, level for health risk or an elevated health risk. The way we calculate the statistic means essentially um, four of those samples in that ring exceeded that 500 level health risk. That was that was just met the threshold for an overall grade of fear. If we look at this season's data for Cass Bay, uh, what we can see, and it's particularly looking in relation to um, rainfall. And I guess if I just step back and talk about known health risks, I mentioned things like storm water outfalls and stock access, but rainfall is also quite clearly a driver of uh, short-term deterioration of water quality because it generates runoff of contaminants off the land, either from uh, agricultural land or in urban areas, the, the runoff generated from hard stand surface that's conveyed via stormwater networks. That runoff of, often contains elevated fecal material from whatever's deposited on the land and is discharged into the receiving environment and results in often short-term poor water quality. And so um, in this example, we looked at where we did have some elevated uh, fecal indicator bacteria or enterococci concentrations, and we also looked at what was the rainfall over the previous 24-hour, 48-hour uh, period. For Cass Bay, uh, there's some mixed results. So the first rain event, 60 mils of rain, and we used Cooper's Knob as our rainfall monitoring site. A small increase in faecal indicator bacteria, but but not exceeding the health levels. On the 29th of December, just before New Year's Eve, um, and, and midweek sampling run, there was only two mil millimetres of rain recorded at Cooper's Knob. That wouldn't be enough to generate uh, surface water runoff. Um, but unfortunately, on that day, there was very high enterococci results recorded for that sample. Again, there was another um, event in early January with, again, zero rainfall, but, but a high um, fecal indicator bacteria result. The rainfall last week, 74 millimetres of rain at Cooper's Knob, didn't result in any elevated indica uh, bacteria at Cass Bay. So the, what that tells us is, uh, look, the bay does have occasional exceedances. Um, they're not always related to rainfall, but certainly for this bay. Um, those health risks are generally managed by the uh, Tamana Ora deciding to issue a temporary health warning, which is then removed once uh, we are confident that the bacteria levels have returned back to those safe thresholds. If we look at Corsair Bay, similar thing, graph on the left hand side shows the last six years of data of, e of enterococci concentrations. Uh, the one thing that stands out, it has a lot more red dots and, and the number of exceedances of that health-based threshold uh, meant that that site was given a long-term grade of poor for this season. Uh, for this season, what we can see is that those two rain events, uh, the 60 mil rain event and the 74 mil rain event, coincided with high enterococci results above the health-based threshold, but also the similar to Cass Bay on the 29th of December with only two millimetres of rain, not enough to generate runoff. We also had a very high enterococci result for that site, again indicating that there are mixed causes for um, uh, these high bacterial results at these sites but also that there's a there's a kind of a difference between those two bays. And I guess the other pet's point I made in the paper was uh, these bays within harbours that are shallow, they are um, 
sheltered bays, they don't get as much um, turbulence as open coastal waters. Those features make them um, quite attractive from a swim perspective, but it also makes them more vulnerable because it means they're not being flushed out or diluted as rapidly as open coastal waters such as Sumner Beach or the, um, the beaches along the Pegasus Bay. So what we um, have planned to do and have been doing this summer is trying to um, investigate the drivers and sources of fecal contamination in uh, Whakarapo, Littleton Harbour, as well as um, sites in Akaraa Harbour. Given the surprising high bacterial results that occurred on the 29th of December when there really wasn't any significant rainfall or runoff, but we observed there was high occupation, high usage of those bays, We've attempted to replicate sampling on those sort of days when it's very hot weather, a lot of people using the bays. Um, we've tried to, uh, we've done sampling on those days to see if we can, and also collect samples for what we call fecal source tracking to see if we can identify what the drivers might be. However, we've found no high fecal results on what we call hot, dry day sampling events. The rainfall event sampling. Um, so last week, um, with the, the high rainfall in Christchurch and 76 millimetres on Cooper's Knob, we undertook um, some quite intensive sampling, that is um, sampling of multiple sites within the bays in Whakarapo Harbour and Akaraua Harbour, as well as sampling as many streams and stormwater outlets that we could find that were discharging into the bay. The results uh, showed a pretty um, expected pattern, which is within on that day of high rainfall, most sites had elevated bacterial results, um, and that did prompt the Tamana Aura to issue a health warning for the, the harbours. We also continued daily sampling, uh, and we found that most sites returned to below health, the health guidelines within 24 hours or within 48 hours for a couple of sites. Um, perhaps the other thing I can comment on is the sampling of the streams and stormwater outlets. Certainly the results for those uh, streams and stormwater outlets showed very high bacterial concentrations in those streams. And, and not surprising, but uh, good to understand that. We did collect samples for what we call fecal source tracking, uh, but they're yet to be analysed. They've at least been collected and stored so they can be analysed um, for the next month or so. And the last, um, just want to highlight that we also have, um, in addition to fecal indicator bacteria, we have currently have health warnings in place for cyanobacteria blooms in some of our coastal lakes and in some of our rivers as well. So uh, that's not unusual for this time of year, and it will depend on how the rest of the season goes as to how long those warnings remain in place or we get any, whether we get any new ones. So I'll leave it at that, unless there's questions. Uh, Tēnā Shirley, thank you for that. Um, are there any questions of clarification for Shirley and the team? Councillor Edge. Thank, thanks, Chair. Thanks, thanks for the presentation. Um, my question is about cyanobacteria. Um, in the last triennium, we had a presentation from um, one of our scientists about uh, the research that was being undertaken on cyanobacteria. And I'm kind of just curious to know where that research is. I think the, the idea was what's the cause of it? And it, it seems to be taking forever to get a definitive answer to that. I mean, uh, uh, the issues that were discussed at the time, low water flows, high nitrate runoff and warm temperatures. And I'm just wondering where that research is at now. Uh, so through you, Chair. So there, there hasn't been that much advanced um, advancement in terms of understanding those drivers. I mean, that's still the the um, the understanding that um, the combined conditions of warm for rivers for cyanobacteria blooms in rivers is stable low conditions, warm temperatures. Uh, sufficient nutrients, in particular nitrogen, as a stimulant, but also other 
sources such as sediment, which can become a source of phosphorus, uh, all can contribute and in combination to uh, favourable conditions for a bloom formation. So that's, that's reasonably well understood. Um, I think the, the question is, uh, what can we do to, to reduce the cyanobacteria blooms? What, of those drivers, what can we lever to, to get improvement? And that's uh, still a difficult question to answer. Inventory question. On page 26, item um, 27, um, you, your long-term grade assessments were determined at 76% of freshwater sites uh, okay for um, primary contact, so that's sites, um, which means that 25% of sites are not. And one of the concerns of a few years ago, there was a campaign of making all the desire to make all rivers swimmable because people not only go to um, specific sites, but they might recreate up in the mountains to the sea, uh, all the way along, picnic, paddle, whatever. Um, do, we, do we take uh, samples periodically along the full stretch of the river from the mountains to the sea to see where the, um, you know, the health of the river from those point of views? Uh, so, uh, just a couple of comments. Uh, just coming back to the, the proportion of sites that had a long-term grade of uh, fear or better that you referenced, that's in relation to microbial quality, not cyanobacteria. So that is specifically in relation to health risks associated with bacteria or, or pathogens. And then the second part of your question around um, absolutely acknowledging that people recreate and use our, our environment and freshwater environment throughout the region. Um, we have long-term ongoing monitoring programs for water quality and indicators of ecological health, which is macroinvertebrates, for example. Uh, we, we try to include sites inland and, and further downstream to, to understand that uh, change, change in ecological condition um, in different parts of the catchment. Uh, we haven't done a lot of high uh, intensive monitoring or investigations along the length of any particular river. Um, I have done some work in the Opahi catchment in particular, looking at longitudinal um, development of cyanobacteria blooms when, when we could see it might, you know, developing increasing length of affected river. So we, I have done that. Um, once in the past. Uh, but, but one of the interesting things, and, and you'll probably see it in this map here, is those two red dots uh, just inland from Christchurch. So the two red dots north of Christchurch are two sites on the Ashley River, uh, Rakahuri, near the coast, that have currently cyanobacteria or health warnings out for um, cyanobacteria blooms in the lower reach of the Ashley River. But the, the two dots inland uh, on the Selwyn River, Waikirikiri, so there are two sites that we monitor that are quite close to the foothills, and they currently have cyanobacteria blooms um, at levels that prompt health warnings. But we also monitor two sites further downstream, Coes Ford and Chamberlain's Ford. And at the moment, things change quickly. They currently don't have cyanobacteria blooms that um, require health warnings. So there's a lot of variability and, and very difficult to predict. Um, where and when the blooms occur. One of the, the most important, and you talked a lot about this before about communications, most important parts of the, the strategy around managing cyanobacteria health risks is um, communication so that people who use rivers know what to look for because it can occur anywhere and we can't monitor everywhere. Just extract something from. Just, just supplementary to what um, Shirley's pointed out, and you mentioned different types of recreation on rivers. The microbial guidelines and the gradings are based on swimming in rivers. So it's to do with the amount of ingestion. So um, 
you, you can't just take it and say that that it's the same for kayaking or um, being on the edge of rivers and things like that. It's based on full immersion swimming in rivers and, and studies that have been done around uh, disease transmission and the link to E. coli and things like that. So. Kia ora, Councillor Leach. Um, Councillor Southwood. Thank you. Thanks um, for your presentation. Um, I'm going to uh, talk about the Pokoro Po Harbour, and I really appreciate I know we've had um, sort of done some work already on that, and I really appreciate your time. Um, I just wondering with in terms of the testing that you did last week, so it's great to hear that we've actually started to look at all, you know, what's the drivers here, which I think there was some thinking that that almost certainly was rainfall for a number of those bays, and hence why we said that the grading changed after the very wet year last year. Um, did, so the so testing last week, you tested all of those harbour sites, not just those that were the better quality. We did all of those. OK, and then when so when um, there's in, in the paper, it mentions that if it's a poor site, we don't routinely go back soon after. Is that is has that been the case for the record record for sites pre this season? Has that been? Uh, so this season, particularly in recognising the um, the importance of Corsair Bay, we have uh, the team have have agreed to sample to do a resampling of that site if it gets a high bacterial result. So yes, we also do a daily or near daily as much as we can practically resampling of Corsair Bay as well. So in in time, like in if we're able to understand with these bays that that it's predominantly rainfall that's causing those spikes and accepting the 29th which was a dry spike and those do happen and those are in other places where you might have a good but that they've still had the odd dry and that we don't necessarily know why if we establish it's rainfall the key risk or the key concern is around the fact that people don't know that it's rained in the past and therefore if we can get a methodology where we can communicate clearly it has rained in this bay this is a site that has a rainfall risk associated with it and we can get those tests coming quite soon after then in theory we could consider taking those high spikes out when it's clearly rainfall driven and re-evaluate the grade for that for that swim site. Is that where we can go to with this? Uh, yeah, and uh, so look, just a couple of things. First, as a reminder that um, the program is run in conjunction with the other agencies, so particularly to Mana Ora, who are the, um, the health authorities uh, and, and the district and city councils in terms of the, the approach it's taken for that monitoring program. So what you described is where we can be confident that a known health risk or a known risk, uh, such as a rainfall event, we can um, predict that risk and we can communicate that risk adequately, or we can be confident that the users of that site understand that risk, then yes, we can uh, do a revised grade by, re by removing the data for those known health risks. And that's what we do for rivers. Um, so we do do that and that's, an agreed approach with the other agencies. Uh, as you're aware, the, our concerns are that we can't be confident that people using those bays are aware that it rained within the last 24 hours or 48 hours. And, and so if, if in agreement with the community and public health or Tamana order and the district and city councils that we have a process in place whereby it's clear to the to the users that there is an elevated house risk after some determined rainfall threshold, um, then yes, the, the same approach with rivers could be used to recalculate a grade. Just um, in terms of though, in terms of this sort of, it sounds like it's a fairly standard policy that if we have a site that's poor, we don't follow up with a, a, a early resample. We just leave it for the weekly standard and so am I right in thinking there's no consideration of the sort of footfall of those particular sites and whether it's a particularly significant swimming spot um, 
And uh, yeah, because, you know, and, and I'm thinking particularly around Fokker Pauline, you know, it's quite a concentration of base. And I'm really wondering, well, how much more resource is it if you've got to go to Puro because it's good and you're going to Hess because it's good and you're bypassing the others? It doesn't take that long. And so, I mean, I've done water sampling. I don't, it doesn't really take that long to put in. I know it does take some time, but, you know, and we can be gathering data. And so would it do, do we put that weight in? And if we don't, should we? Or is that something we could consider? Yeah, so um, we've learned a lot about, you know, the importance of some of these um, these areas and, of course, we can adjust the program to meet, you know, to meet um, community requirements. So, yes, we can do that. It does come at a resource implication. Uh, the difficulty around particularly coastal base sampling is we do it on high tide and that narrows our window down for our field team. But, yeah, look, taking on board, absolutely, those. Uh, desires from the community. Yep. Thank you, Council Southwood, Councillor Pons. Hold on. Yeah, um, I want to thank uh, you guys for bringing all this information to us as well. Um, as someone who uses Whakaro for quite a lot out on the water uh, and take kids, etc., there, um, definitely concerned about what's happened over summer. Um, I've got a couple of questions. Um, so the long term trend stuff, um, so I get that the, the weekly stuff, you've put the table in our paper there about uh, the levels of E. coli that triggers certain things, but I'm still unsure about the long term grades. So what what is that based on? Is it an average or a medium of the E. coli at what level over the five years? Can, can you just tell us that? That's my first question. Yeah. Sure. So the following the guidelines, uh, we, we take the five year of weekly results and we calculate what we call a 95th percentile statistic. So that means uh, ranking the data the 95th result out of 100. Uh, if the, that 95th percentile statistic exceeds uh, thresholds in that table, in combination with, um, there's a bit of a matrix, but generally in combination with our understanding about you know, known risk at the site that determines the long term grade. And that and that relates to um, and they might be able to talk to it, known health risks, yeah, risks of infection or illness. So that it's that statistic relating to uh, studies that determine the risk of elevated risks of illness or infection. That so for these sites that would be ninety fifth percentile over two sixty. Indrik Cocker, yeah. Zero. So in table one in the paper, that provides the table for the response to the weekly sampling results. Uh, when it comes to the long term grades, I didn't put it in the paper, but the the 95th percentile statistic for enterococci is compared to 500 enterococci per 100 mole. That's the threshold above which um, elevated health risks. Yep. I mean, one of my responses to to this is that I think to the locals and to me, <laughs> um, it seemed like a surprise this year. But actually, when you look at the five year data, it's not so much of a surprise, especially maybe to you guys that have more information on the data. And I think that's potentially one of the issues here is that maybe we should have been telling people more about this over the last three or four years saying that, you know, like you've said in your paper, um, you know, these bays are vulnerable, the size and shape of them, the direction they face, they don't get as much flush, uh, et cetera. That would, you know, it would have been good because we would have been able to preempt stuff that might be happening. So I think that's important going forward that we really message that really strongly and maybe not, not just here in Whakaropo, but anywhere we have similar long-term trends that have been showing for a while now to say to the community, don't be surprised this summer when we get a rainfall event, et cetera, that these might be shut. I mean, I think that's good. Um, and, you know, there's obviously multiple factors and for the community. So this is leading to my next question. Thank you, Chair. Um, is for the, for the community, they really want to know why. 
where it's coming from and maybe what actually we can all do about it. And I know, you know, I'm confused a little bit by the graphs because where we have um, not any rainfall, we've had a massive spike. And in your paper, you have alluded to the fact that that could be from the people themselves. And that's interesting because I'm sure that people themselves will be keen not to have an impact on their environment. So that's another educational matter we could potentially work on. Um, but here's my question. Um, are there are there other potential reasons for that? And can we find this out or not? I'm really keen to know. We're certainly trying to find out. So uh, that's that equal source tracking technology that could at least tell us whether the fecal contamination is caused by animals, humans, birds, or dogs, largely, or um, you know, livestock. Um, we probably will never know the cause of the uh, fecal contamination event on the 29th of December because we weren't able to use that technique. Uh, but but it was look just looking at you know what what do we think potential sources are, and we had um, anecdotal observations of a lot of uh, dog fecal material along the walking track that goes all the way past all of those bays, simply a large number of people. And if you've been to a swimming pool where you've had to evacuate, you'll know what sometimes little children can do. Um, and also there's a lot of recreational boating. And I've had several people come up to me and describe what they used to do in their boats when they're out in the harbour. So look, they're just, uh, they are potential sources but I absolutely agree that um, improving the messaging around, you know, hey, we can all do our bit to help reduce the risk of these kind of fecal contamination events is really important. And I think this season, as sad it, as it is for the community not being able to or not feeling safe to use the bays, it has raised the profile and perhaps we can leverage off that in terms of um, improved understanding both about the risks but also about individual responsibility. So. There's an opportunity there as well. Thank you. Uh, that's that's a great answer, and I, I suppose that's what's where my mind's going to is, you know, when you look at all the matters that can influence these bays and other swimming sites, storm water, sewage. Um, well, that's the TLA responsibility, but we're the consent authority for both of them, so we do need to take some responsibility there. So keen to work on that a bit more. The matter about the people and the pets and the boating, I think, is a really good one. And I'd love to see us look at that a bit more again in this particular context. That would be with CCC, being they are the owners of the land and the administrators of the land around where those people go swimming. The recreational boating one would be maybe a different avenue of relationship for us. I don't know whether that's maritime or it's our harbour master. So we do have some responsibility there. And the other one I think would be um, in this context with the four company. Um, just around harbour operations and having a bit of information flow around that because I know that there was some anecdotal stuff that people started saying about cruise ships, right? Even though that might not be true, but that's what people were searching for because they're looking for somewhere to blame in a, in a bit. So I think we've got to be really a bit more, a bit like our previous thing, working with all the agencies that we can to get better messaging out to people as soon as possible. So yeah, thank you so much. Uh, kia ora, Councillor Pauling. Just on um, Shirley, just on this, this graph in front. So for next year, that graph, that circle is going to move this way for you. Um, so those three, three directions. Uh, that's correct. That the circle will move along, you know, a cluster. Um, and as you can see, this this season we have had already three exceedances of that. Uh, oh, actually, sorry. Let me get my glasses. I talked about the 95th percentile threshold as compared to 500 enterococci. It's slightly different number. Keep in your mind for uh, long-term grading versus uh, short-term health risks, and so. For the long term grading, you're looking at the number of dots that are above the 500 enterococci, which is actually only two this season so far. Fingers crossed. But, but regardless, um, on a look at, you know, we'd have to go and calculate the statistic, but on the value, on face value there, you've still got, um, you know, 
quite a number of samples above that 500, and yes, it's most likely in the absence of modifying the grade because we can manage those some of those risks that would remain poor, most likely. And carrying on for Councillor Wild, Councillor Pauling says just that, that messaging and thing up front before the start of the kind of swimming season, yeah, and all those kind of things will have to happen. Um, thank you for that. Uh, moving on to Councillor East. Um, thank you. Uh, this is <clears throat> a uh, subject that's pretty um, dear to my heart. In 1973, I joined the then North Canterbury Catchment Board, uh, fresh out of the university, and worked under Bob Airy, who I think transitioned into ECAN. Uh, and we set up uh, a network of uh, sampling sites around the North Canterbury Catchment Board area. Um, primarily testing for E. coli and dissolved oxygen at the time. Um, so I'm, I'm uh, cognizant of the fact that we are talking here of recreational sampling. Um, so my questions are probably going to be around the sites themselves and whether, whether we um, outside of recreation, monitor E. coli uh, for a greater period other than the November to March period? And if so, are they at the same sites or different sites? And, um, and I have a philosophy which I sort of really wanted to test with you really. Back in those days, we, we were doing a lot of catchment management plans uh, for a variety of activities. Uh, flood management being probably the primary one, and we sort of tagged on water quality uh, as an assessment to those uh, catchment management reports. So I, uh, whilst I'm interested in the recreational quality um, sampling, I'm A, interested in where we're sampling. I'd like a little bit more detail just to probably satisfy myself that uh, the site best represents water quality in that part of the catchment. And I think another speaker spoke about the uh, mountains to the sea. Well, I mean, I, I can remember sampling of, in the Waimakariri catchment starting at um, Arthur's Pass and various sites all the way down the river. Um, so the questions really are, can, can I have a more detailed sort of analysis of where we are sampling. Uh, secondly, do we um, extend our E. coli, particularly sampling um, outside the recreational area um, to get a picture of, of what's happening in the catchment itself? And, and B, uh, lastly, is there any consideration to looking at our ECAN area in a catchment by catchment analysis um, to actually have a better picture of a recreational and B other uses of our um, our catchments in terms of water quality. Thank you. Yes, so, so yes, uh, we certainly do monitor E. coli and a range of other water quality parameters as part of a long term. A monitoring network that we run across Canterbury that uh, involves monthly sampling at a number of river and well river sites throughout the region. Uh, we can provide you with a summary or a map of of those sites. Uh, they include inland areas, coastal areas, um, and middle reaches of our rivers. So that's monthly sampling for E. coli um, across the region at a number of river sites. So uh, we do that. We can provide you with with a summary a summary of that work um, and catchment management that's right um, catchment management you can respond to that um, look uh, across the environment Canterbury um, and particularly the, um, in conjunction with zone committees you know, areas of particular interest or concern um, or high value um, there are various um, programs in place to identify whether you know, actions can be taken to achieve improvements if there is an issue with deterioration. So 
Uh, that's always been a long-standing but varied program with Environment Canterbury. Um, I'm not sure I can, we can probably provide you with some specific examples. Yeah, look, I, I suppose I'm um, playing the devil's advocate a little bit in that even a number of our water zones transcend um, one or more catchments. And, and from my point of view, I, I it would involve a little bit more collaborative work between um, varying um, sections of ECAN. But I, I believe in the long run, a catchment based analysis of most of the uh, functions of, of a uh, waterway in the long term is a better way of, of um, looking at the necessary requirements, both from an engineering and um, health standard in the catchment. Yeah, I guess absolutely agree with that. And um, that's the, I guess, through particularly the, the National Policy Statement for Freshwater Management um, sets out that uh, approach, that holistic, integrated, uh, kūtiki tai, mountains, you know, the, the whole integrated um, approach to how we manage our fresh and marine environment. So absolutely agree with that. Kenakwe Shirley, that's correct. You know, with the um, integrated planning coming up, the uh, Kiataki Tai, and that's summer. Uh, Council East, that's uh, where the Ngarunanga would like to see Environment Canary go as well. As uh, Shirley just said, that you know, holistic view of um, you know from the mountains to the sea, um, and encapsulating everything in that in that catchment. So I think that's where we will be going. Um, yeah, and so a lot of the work that he can, especially with that integrated planning, that's the direction we, we will be. Got that. Um, yeah. Over to uh, Council Slicks. Nothing? Uh, anyone else for clarifications? But, oh, Council Ward? Um, just a comment, and I hope it doesn't happen again, but a few of us got approached between Christmas and New Year last year by the media. So it would be good if something was going to get out of control that we had a bit of a heads up, I guess. But I mean, I hope that that doesn't happen again. And I see. It reminded me of one final question, sorry, which is around testing over Christmas, because it really hit at just the worst possible time, that 29th of December. So I'm just wondering, have we got any feedback from the labs or Scott's? Are we putting in place some sort of mechanisms where we can respond more effectively the next? It's Sod's law, isn't it, that everyone in the house is on holiday at the time and we need to be responding to holiday events. So, yeah. Uh, absolutely. So uh, the laboratory has um, clarified with us how how we can get uh, something done after hours. It's still pretty restricted, but but we can do it through um, if we can achieve some advance warning. Um, and we're also looking at techniques where we can collect samples for fecal source tracking and store it in house while the labs are actually closed. So yes, we are looking at how we can be more responsive during those unfortunate public holidays, but it's not the first time it's happened over Christmas, so it is difficult. Uh, Kilda, there's no more questions, so I would ask the, um, uh, Shirley and Elaine to, you can leave the table. So Tim, you can sit back. <laughs> um, therefore, I'd like to put the motion forward. Um, the recommendation is on page 22, it's on the screen, that the Water and Land Committee receive Information provided on monitoring of water quality for contact recreation in Canterbury. Do I have a mover? Councillor Edge, seconder. Councillor Southworth. Uh, any discussion? No discussion. All those in favour? Oh, sorry. I just want to say, uh, yeah, it's been a really big issue that hit, and um, and it's been stressful for everyone. And I know it will have been stressful for staff too. And I just really like to acknowledge what works happening and that we will take this, take the lessons learned and make sure that we put something in place to work better next time. And that's, you know, that's the right way. That's how we should be doing things. So thank you. Thank you. Councillor Paul. Yeah, I like to support that. I'm really keen to work with Vicky uh, and Yan and uh, Claire as the chair of this committee. 
uh, at Paul and anyone else who wants to be involved to just work on that with staff over the uh, next year so that next summer we can get those messages out to people because, you know, by the looks of it, we'll still be in that sort of poor to very poor long-term grade, so generally unsuitable for swimming. So people need to know that um, and we really need to hammer in those risks. But also, importantly, uh, informing the community about what we're actually doing about all those potential sources of risk um, and how we're working with CCC and others to deal with those. So I think that's really important to get those messages out too. So looking forward to that. Enough work. Nothing else. Oh, okay. That's what. Um, all those in uh, favour say aye. Aye. Against. Not against. Other uh, motion is carried. Sure, was though. Um, got a councillor Mackay. No. Aritonu Waru de Katifa on to 8.4 update on the NES regulations implementation. I would ask, ask Judith to come up to the table, please. Uh, there's a presentation, drops on tap. Um, it'll be on the screen a minute shortly. Um, Judith. Aroha mai, Judith. Akira Tato, just a bit of a deliberation here. Um, so 12.32, we have to take a break um, anyway. But if we take a natural break now here for 10 minutes um, and then hopefully then that'll take us, we could probably carry on up to um, to, to 12.51. Um, yeah, so Judith, are you okay? So if we take 10 minutes now, 10 minute break, because after you know two hours, we have to take a break. Uh, and then at, um, what's the time? So at uh, 12.35, um, we'll start again and then we'll complete the clip, finish the meeting off. Oops, we don't have to do a resolution on it? No. Nah. Uh, kia ora tato, uh, we'll resume. Councillor Sunkner, would you please take your seat? Kia tere. Uh, kia ora, Judith. Nau tua, kia ora. Tēnā koutou katoa, um, ko Judith Ilgilei, the whole. Um, I'm here in my capacity as General Manager for Regulatory Services, um, covering off the, just some highlights from the paper item um, 8.4 in your agenda. This paper was prepared by Tammy Woods, who has been fortunately been off sick um, for a wee while, so um, I'm presenting on her behalf. I do have some staff in the room if the specific questions around some of the um, items covered. Um, so we have um, Sarah, Claire and Nikki um, and Leonie as well. So if that, at question time, I'll pull on the right person. Um, so this is a this slide just highlights um, the image around how the national regulations that came into effect as part of the package for um, freshwater improvements lies between our Canterbury Land and Water Regional Plan that we have operative in our region and we spent significant time with our community um, developing, and it comes into effect now ahead of a future planning um, framework signalled through also that national direction for fresh water. Um, you might recall we previously in a briefing made mention that these there are a number of regulations that are sequenced over time, so quite a lot happening, and they came into effect as a mechanism to give immediate change and halt the water quality decline. So the national regulations, they implemented all apply equally across all of New Zealand, and um, they, for people, um, they're predominantly related to rural activities, but not exclusively. And for people impacted by these regulations, they need to often com, um, balance up the Canterbury Land and Water Regional Plan provisions and the national regulations as they are, and the more stringent one over effects. So we're trying to work through a part of this update is just to, our progress on implementing those regulations, focusing particularly on, on two of them. When we go about implementing regulations or any new, new requirement that a community needs to do, it could be a rule in a plan or in this case out of um, central government, we always follow a sequence stage of educating, engaging, enabling, enforcing. And I use the taglines on the left if we start with making sure people know what they need to do and we work through to the point of are people doing what they need to do, um, if, if you figure? And that's a journey, and sometimes it's a bit iterative. And, 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 um, but it's a very proactive approach that we've traditionally taken to this. Um, over 
quite an extensive period in Environment Canterbury from water metering regulations um, and, and back, you know, 10 years ago, et cetera. Um, just wanted to highlight a key point that when we go about implementing these regulations, we don't do them in isolation as, as council staff. We engage with industry partly to help us. Um, they are part of the solution. We know what it takes to get the behaviour change and the adoption of new new actions. Um, it require, people don't necessarily come for us for information and support, so those industry sectors can have a role to play, an important role to play. Um, we try to give centralised places for people to access the resources that they need. Um, so we've developed this Farmers Hub website for all the ones that relate to rural activities and have up-to-date information, again, all about people knowing what to do. The other element about engaging with the industry at this point is that it does help inform us what would be the best approach we need to take. What are the barriers that uh, exist for um, around an, engaging on an issue? And so with working with the industry, um, rural industry sector on these national regulations, the feedback we got was really quite strongly that there were two particular regulations that we needed to put a bit more meat around, given they fundamentally shifted, um, they were quite a big shift for the community to adapt to. So that's where we've wrapped a campaign approach around them. So they particularly related to um, the um, synthetic um, fertiliser nutrient application and the intensive winter grazing. And I've got a slide on each of those, those now. So in the intensive winter grazing regulations, um, I do want to highlight um, some of the bullet points um, repeats what was in the paper. But I do want to highlight that we actually have had an update in the consent numbers on the last bullet point. So we've had three intensive winter grazing consents actually granted, and there are eight in process now. So um, I think it was four on the paper when that was the figure we had at that point. Um, but I guess what the take home I want you to take from the slide is the range of opportunities to get the message out, have resources that help people engage with knowing what they need to do and in the, the way forward on this. I do know with regard to intensive winter grazing, there is a lot of interest into how Canterbury is going to implement this. We have the largest area of intensive winter grazing in New Zealand, um, closely followed by Southland and Otago. Um, and um, compliance with the regulation is always a, a journey rather than a, a, than a, a black and white approach when you think of it in a really practical level. Um, and all the requirements around intensive winter grazing, the, the, the need for an intensive winter grazing management plan is a foundation block. Um, so whether they're a, someone's a permitted activity or if they, they need to need a consent. So, so that's a really key message we've been, we'll be sharing with that rural community. And it has been one that we've actually been sharing for a number of years already, um, have your intensive winter grazing management plan. When that comes to applying a consent, you actually have to supply that. So, um, so when we think about checking up on are people doing what they're doing, that's the types of questions we ask. Um, we also know we can't be everywhere all at once, and so we have to take a prioritised risk-based approach with working with the community around that. What that actually means is if there's complaints around activities, we respond. It's having an environmental effect now. We've become aware of it. We, we, we respond. Um, if it comes to, if the, there was concern um, that staff and uh, undertaking other activities become aware of or answer questions, we ask questions. What are you doing? Do you have your intensive winter grazing plan? Do you fit into permitted activity status, et cetera? And I guess the other area is focusing our attention into certain places. And at a start, we're taking a, uh, where the risks the environmental risks of this practice being undertaken incorrectly are greatest as we will be focusing our efforts. So that's sensitive receiving environments um, and, and probably those areas around, around higher slope. So that's just a little bit of a um, recognising that compliance with these conditions as well as all the other compliance monitoring activities we do, we can't, we can't be everywhere.
The second campaign package um, that was put together was around the synthetic fertiliser nutrient application, or referred to as NCAP frequently. This, this was really a big shift for Canterbury. The Land and Water Regional Plan was based on a managing outputs, and here was a central government national regulation coming down requiring an input control on, on and a re requirement for reporting. So that was one of the reasons why um, a, the industry was keen to see a bit of a wraparound approach for how we work through that. So campaigns generally are multi-level. We start with those stages of educating, engaging, and then work, work through the process. And that's all that I wanted to come on. Uh, Tēnākui, Judith, any uh, questions for clarification? Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I guess my question and my conversations with you and, and others within the organisation is how we implement the, the intensive winter grazing challenge and minimise the number of people that will be required to gain a consent, knowing that in 18 months' time they will be rolling into a freshwater pan and going through the same price place <coughs> process and cost and the like again. So. Having seen the slide that's up there, we, we talk about prioritisation and probably looking at slope and hills to the north and south of us and some, some areas uh, of, of significant risk. What statements can we make with real clarity? Because I, I know you've said we, we've made statements, we have stuff online, but that message is not out there in a, in a very clear manner to, to industry, and given the conversations that I've been having with them. So, so what simple statements can we make talking about, yes, we maintain compliance and monitoring, that is our, our first priority, and, and then state where our priorities sit so that there's some confidence out in industry that we're not pushing people into thousands of dollars worth of consenting processes when in 18 months' time, as the, they become the priority, they can roll into a new process. Is, are there some simple statements we can make? I think I think that's sort of a yes and no question. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Yeah. So um, I think one of the things we've been really clear with, and the rural sector has been engaging with Ministry for the Environment on this issue, is that it's not council alone that drives people wanting to comply with the dates and timeframes of these regulations. Individuals will have their own circumstances. And so we have to have pathways like consenting options live and open. And um, that, yeah. yeah. Um, um, the other is around that prioritised approach and the fact that compliance starts with, you know, the implementation progress is a compliance approach of are people doing what they're doing? The drop-in days is that conversation to go, do you know what to need to do and are you doing it? Um, and I think we've got a freshwater farm plan workshop planned for next week, um, which you might recall. Oh, so look, previously there is a freshwater, under the regulations, there is a freshwater farm plan pathway for intensive winter grazing. If it can be demonstrated that, is, that, it, that it would fit there, there might be cases where those individuals will still need a consent for this activity as well. So I, it is still evolving, but I go the prioritised approach will be focusing on implementation in the areas where the risks are likely, environmental effects are likely to be greatest, um, and work with the industry sector around that. Yeah, and, and I guess for some councillors, the challenge is I have a, a farm environment plan. I have the module for intensive winter grazing already sitting in that plan with the same effects and outcomes put in space. Uh, in place, it's a land use consent. The legislation requires me to have a discharge consent. The risk has already been taken care of within that process. Um, the monitoring still continues. So the challenge is, um, yeah, what cost or what process do I have to go through in the interim? If we And if we can remove that for 18 months as we prioritise, we then roll those land use consents into, into discharge consents in the process. So it's how we're just very clear in articulating our prioritisation so that we don't bring people into time and money and effort for something that is not required given where this is in 18 months' time and the risk profile that they sit. 
And I've got no question at all in my mind that those that don't have land use consents are our priority and slope in the deal. It's just the first adopters, um, we're always, it's double jeopardy for them. So, so how do we achieve those outcomes? And my conversations with uh, MFB and consultants to MFB, they state again the obvious, why would we put people through that process knowing where we will end up with freshwater plans in 18 months? So it's just really been clear on that messaging if we can. Thank you. Councillor Edge. Just, uh, just, thanks. I just wondered about the permitted activity, if that was sort of something that you encourage. Do, do the rules suggest guidance on, say, setbacks um, related to slope from a, a waterway? And if, if the farmer meets those setback conditions, um, then is, is, the, is that basically a permitted uh, a non consentable approach? Yeah, there is a permitted activity pathway here, which is around the um, critical source areas are excluded from intensive intergrazing, lower slope, um, setback distances, etc. So that's all there. And we are finding that some landowners are taking the time to assess do they adjust those activities to fit their permitted activity rather than doing what they've got, they've got now and entering those other pathways. So that's that time. Yeah. I'll just interrupt there. Uh, it's 12.51. So kia ora tatou, nei te mea te kia ora he wā maumahara, uh, mō te rū whenua i, I te, te kau uh, rua tau i, I pauri. Just, just, uh, it's 12.51. Now, if we could just take a bit of time to reflect on the, uh, the earthquake that hit us uh, 12 years ago. Um, just, yeah, time of reflection, thinking where you were at the time and, you know, things that happened. Um, and then also reflecting on things that happened in the North Island at this time as well. So, um, he wā whakata, i te wā. ドキドキドキドキドキドキドキドキドキドキドキドキドキドキドキドキドキドキドキドキドキドキドキドキドキドキドキドキドキドキドキドキドキドキドキドキドキドキドキドキドキドキドキドキドキドキドキドキドキド
Thank you, Sarah. Uh, kia ora, Sarah Hiddle. Um, I was online last week. Um, we've spent quite a bit of time liaising with industry. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> and in this respect, I'm probably more um, speaking around Dairy NZ, Beef and Lamb, Dairy NZ. Um, they've been working with us and other councils on a lot of the interpretations and questions, things like that, that have come through. And we've um, been heavily relying on them working in the designing and implementation of a farmer's intense winter grazing management plan. Uh, and that's the space that they've indicated to us that they wish to work in. Uh, that's the, the practical side. That's where we're going to get the on the ground environmental outcomes. And we're really happy for them to work in that space. When they then move into the regulatory space, they're um, sort of passing them through to us in different spheres um, or through to consultants as well. So some farmers will generally go straight to working with their consultants uh, and we've got plans in place to work more with them as well. Uh, we've been working with a number of them over the years anyway, especially through the um, farming land use consent pathways. So yeah, a lot going on there. Um, meeting with them quite yeah quite often as well and any new ones that come in. Um, probably just thinking at the moment of the MPI on farm support team as well. So you know they've approached us to um, be able to work with us in the space as well. I guess a follow up to industry and consultants. I don't have a farm consultant. I don't utilise industry very much, and very few people that I know actually use consultants and industry. So. The challenge is when we think that we're informing industry and consultants, do you have an understanding of what percentage of farmers out there actually use consultants in industry? Because that creates a challenge. Um, I would say it's a lot more now than what it probably was previous to farming land use consents. There was a lot more, um, a lot more consultants came into the industry uh, in the rural professional industry, I should say, during that time. And, and so there was a lot of farmers who brought them into to part of their farm, what I would call their farm business team, who also includes things like accountants and beat managers and things like that. Um, the, there will be a number of people that we're working with in the intensive winter grazing space who sit outside of that, who, because they didn't require farming land use consent, they may not have worked with someone in, in that industry. So they could be coming into this space now um, and going through that um, process on their own. And we're trying to make it so that that can happen. Um, you know, we, we review, we listen to feedback um, as part of the process to see where we can make adjustments for that to happen. Um, and because for a number of farms, they may not need a consultant. They may be able to, to go through the process without it. There will be properties that um, potentially, if, if for whatever reason, the risk is higher um, or, you know, they have some complexities around their um, situation that they will decide to use a consultant. Councillor Yep. Um, any other points of clarification? Sure, sir. Thank you for that. Any other points of clarification? No. Um, Judith, Sarah, you can leave the table. Hilda, thank you for that. Um, thank you, Tim, as well. Uh, therefore, um, I'd like to put the motion on, um, on recommendation on page 32 uh, that the Land and Water Committee receives the information in this paper about Environment Cannabis Program to implement the national regulations in progress. Um, do I have a mover? Councillor Pauling, seconder. Councillor Seinfeld. Um, any discussion? Councillor Pauling. Yeah, just like to. Um, really congratulate the staff on bringing this information to us. It's really important that we get the information out to the public as well. And to acknowledge, you know, there's a lot of work going on, um, you know, across all those areas that the freshwater um, policies affect, wetlands, um, intensive winter grazing, the water measuring, stock exclusion, etc. And, you know, lots of things that are really impacting on uh, land and resource users out there. And I think it's the other great thing is to acknowledge the work that our staff yep. are trying to do with those other agencies as well, uh, MFE and MPI, uh, but also with our with our farmers and landowners out there. So they're yeah, just acknowledging that and really support it. Thank you. Nothing else. Uh, therefore, I'd like to uh, 
with the motion, all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? None. Carried. Got it. Kilda Judas, Sarah, um, Claire, Nikki, and Leone. Thank you for your, your mahi. Uh, moving on to Waru Irikati Rima, uh, 8.5. Io Ngairo, Te Pataka Raka Hotu, the Banks Miniature Hydrographic Project. Uh, Director of you, Doctor. Kia ora, Kia ora Chair. Um, <coughs> so, um, I'm happy to present this paper. Um, Fiona Shannon, who's uh, the author of the paper, is on leave at the moment. She's actually preparing to go on God's own, so um, I'm much happier to be here than in her shoes. <laughs> but, um, this is a project, the Ionairo um, Tapataka or Rako Hotu, which you may be more familiar with. It's been referred to in the past as the Banks Peninsula Hydrographic Project. The name itself of Ionairo um, was gifted to us from um, Onuku. The, the, we're bringing it to you for two reasons, really. One is it's a significant investment from the council that has been made 1.8 million over three years in this project, um, which you know is is um, a tremendous investment that's being made, and we want to report back on it. But I think probably the main reason that we're wanting to bring it back is just that it is a very exciting project, and it is something that's showing some really interesting results. Um, the the <coughs> um, way that we've worked with um, the Papata Gurunaka and Department of Conservation to get a project together that is benefiting all the parties and is, um, you know, as I said earlier, providing some really interesting results is, is worth um, celebrating and, and bringing out into the public. So that's why we brought it here. It actually leverages off a substantial investment from LINS, uh, Land, um, Land Information New Zealand, who did the coastal survey they were doing at the time the survey of the uh, the coast for the um, the hydrographic survey of uh, to improve their maps for the around banks peninsula and it was an opportunity that came to take that information and build on it and get some really good knowledge around some of the ecology of the um, in and around the bays of of banks peninsula and within the harbours, and also you know some of the physical knowledge of what's actually going on. So, um, as, as you can see in paragraph four, it talks about the key focus is understanding drivers of change and climate impacts on those ecosystems. So, um, the the paper speaks for itself. I, I won't say anything else, um, I, except just to point out that since we last reported on it, the University of Otago has been contracted in as the science partner, so the delivery of the science for this project, and they've been a, an excellent partner for all of us working in together to get these results. So, Chair. Any, uh, any points of clarification, any questions? Councillor Southworth. Sure, thanks. Um, for this. I'm hoping next time we get this come back, there'll be some pictures of the things that have been seen underwater. So that was really useful to read and understand about the ground truthing that has to go on. And it makes it really clear why it's so expensive and complicated piece of work. Um, what I'm interested in is, so this is being done around Banks Peninsula. There's a, a lot of land use impacts flowing out from our rivers right the way along the coast of Canterbury. So is there thinking around or do, have we, yeah, what, what's the thinking around gathering the data of this type or something similar to understand what do we currently have? And then what's the thinking around having, you know, this sets a baseline. Like I, I believe that this peninsula piece of work is first. That sets us an understanding of what we've got currently, but to really understand what's then being impacted as well, it needs follow up. So are we basically seeing an uplift in, are we going to see an uplift in the amount of research, investigation and mapping understanding of our impacts of land use on our marine environment and climate change, all those things. I mean, it's a huge topic and it's one that's been really, really under researched for an awfully long time. And so it's great to see it, but to really make best use of it, we need to understand and, that, and it's going to take more work, isn't it? To, or is it? <laughs> you give me some, some feedback on that. Um, through you, Chair, look, it's, it's difficult to say. Uh, I mean, you, you, I certainly agree with you. This sets a baseline and, and it requires
provides further work in terms of the um, elsewhere in the region. This was an opportunity that came to us through the um, the lens piece that was being done in and around it, and it was also a recognition of you know that this is a really special part of the coast, and, and I suppose I shouldn't diminish the rest of the coast of Canterbury, That's but okay. <laughs> but, um, but you know this is is a really special part of um, coastal ecology. So. Whether we carry it on elsewhere, I mean, there has been a substantial amount done in and around Kaikoura for other pieces of, um, for, for other reasons. And, and I guess if this opportunity arose elsewhere, then we would certainly be looking hard to, to carry it on. But we don't have a program that says, we, you know, next, next up we will do the, sort of, you know, I don't, I don't know, um, Pegasus Bay up to the Conway or something like that. We don't have that kind of program. Um, it is tremendously expensive, and and it and it is a, you know a big commitment that was made by the council for this very special place. So, I think you know we we'll, we will certainly be considering it, but we don't have anything in place right now that says we will definitely do that. Hi, Kira, Tim. Yeah, I just want to acknowledge you saying how special it is that that place out there. That uh, I can very concur one hundred percent. Any other points of clarification? Councillor Edge. Quickly, the, the reference to um, including baits with the camera equipment, well, how does that work? Yeah. Um, we have got online, and I should have acknowledged earlier, Davina McNichol, who's also involved in this project, although I suspect Davina is probably in the same uh, area of me that I don't know enough detail on it. But from what I can understand, that's putting bait beside a camera that allow and then fish come to it and you can see and count the fish that come and see what the fish community is. That that but that's as the limit of my knowledge. And uh, Davina, I don't know if you know anything more. Um oh kia ora koutou. it's Davina McNichol here. Um yes, that's about as much as I know, Tim. But what I would want to point out, and this goes back to Councillor Southwest um mentioned earlier about wanting to see some pictures. I was lucky enough to see the very first preliminary set of imagery that we're getting from the project on Monday. So our science partners have promised to develop that alongside some of the 3D imagery that's coming through the analysis of the data we got from LINS. And they're gonna put all of that together uh, into some really fantastic uh, pictures and images for us to, to view. So we're really hoping that soon we'll be able to bring all of that back to you for our next update. Um, but yeah, the, the cameras, the baited cameras, um, I think that's exactly how they work, Tim. I don't know anything further, sorry. Good, thank you, Davina. Anything else? No, nothing else. Kia ora um, Thank you, Tim, Davina. Uh, we'll first put the motion forward, um, 8.5 on recommendation on, on page 40, uh, that the land, uh, the Water and Land Committee receives the update on the progress of Iho Ngairo, Patakaraka Hotu, Banks Furniture Hydrographic uh, Project. Do I have a mover? Councillor Davies, seconder, Councillor Ward. Uh, any discussion? No discussion. Um, all those in favour say aye. Aye. Against? None. Motion is carried. Kia ora koutou. Uh, the next meeting of the Land and Water uh, Committee will be held on Wednesday, the 3rd of May 2023. Um, just there also that there's a workshop on all two body kai after after lunch today. Yep. So uh, on that note, I declare the meeting closed at 108 and invite Councillor Swiggs to close off with Kalakia. Uh, kia Kia Fakaria uh, Te Tapu Ke Watea Ai Te Ara Kia Turi Kia Fakataha Ai Kia Turiki, Pakataha, I, Omie, Uye, Taiki. Jorotato, Nate Mehatsky, Kutu.